This is episode 27 of Ice Ice Beta, a podcast about climbing with tools and, on occasion, about training for climbing with tools. And I'm your host, Aaron Gary. I'm sure Carolyn Parker could have become a household name if she had wanted. In her 20s and 30s, Carolyn was one of the most talented all-around mountain athletes in the U.S. She was one of the first women to become an AMGA certified rock guide, climbed 512 trad at altitude, went on 8,000 meter peak expeditions, sent M8, skied 50 degree couloirs, and regularly ran mountain ultras. Or, as Sarah Hudson, our co-host for this episode puts it, Carolyn is a boss. Climbing was only half the story though. After flirting with the limelight, Carolyn found that she derived as much, if not more, satisfaction from helping others achieve their objectives as she did in accomplishing her own. As a result, climbing and guiding eventually transitioned into training and coaching. Now, more than 35 years later, Carolyn has worked with thousands of athletes in the pursuit of their dreams. In this episode, we chat about the life, times, and challenges of being a female climber in the 90s, choosing to stay just under the radar, her philosophy and approach to running a coaching business, the mental and physical aspects of strength training for female athletes, how the hormonal cycle and nutrition impact athletic performance, and navigating menopause. We'll get to the conversation shortly, but first I want to thank Sarah for joining this episode as co-host, and of course, a shout out to our sponsors for making the podcast possible. We get it. For us, ice season never really ends. It just kind of blends between rock, plastic, and plywood until waterfalls freeze over again. No matter how you climb in the off season, Furnace Industries keeps you going till your next bout of screaming barfies. With their gym safe dry ice evolutions, you can keep up your fitness indoors. And if you like to challenge yourself on your home wall, they have the largest variety of dry tool holds in America. Check out their full lineup of ice and dry tooling gear at furnace-industries.com. Because for us, it's always ice season. Hi, it's Katie McKinstry Stylos. And when it comes to winter climbing, having the right gloves can make or break your day on the ice. With a new, you're in good hands. A small boutique brand founded by passionate climbers for climbers. The mission is simple, to create the best ice climbing and dry tooling gloves that are durable, dexterous, and waterproof. Personally, I can't imagine climbing any day on tools without my new gloves. Whether I'm on a steep pitch and highlight climbing in my Vincent Lights, playing in the bingo cave with my Vincent mitts, or climbing at my limit in the Dolomites of Italy. They're my reliable partner in the cold and on tools. Experience the difference with Anu. Check them out at anu.com. Really excited to chat with you, Carolyn. We also, doing something a little bit different today, we have Sarah Hudson, who's joining as a co-host. And so just so that the listener can get a sense of, you know, voice, who's speaking, Sarah, do you mind just giving a quick intro about yourself? Sure. Yeah, my name's Sarah. I'm 33. I would consider myself a cascade climber and skier, mostly based out of Seattle, but I've lived uh, probably in three or four different spots of Washington and have done a lot of mostly climbing in the Pacific Northwest, but also diehard ice climber. So I try to get out every winter in the, the Rockies and down into Montana, Wyoming and Colorado too. Nice. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you. Carolyn, you strike me as someone that likes to collect quotes. And I'm not sure if that's true, so correct me if I'm wrong. But I was reading an article about your coaching journey, and two of them, you actually led the article with it, and uh, they stood out to me. One was, strength does not come from physical capacity. It comes from an indomitable will by Mahatma Gandhi. And the second one is, the mind is primary by Mark Twight. And I'm just wondering if if you could maybe elaborate on on what those quotes mean to you. Absolutely. Um, I think, I, I don't know if I'm someone who collects quotes, but I utilize them sometimes just in the sense of they can do what we're doing now, which is begin a conversation. Someone might be like, oh, you know, they're, they're, they're caught by that. And so their brain is ready to be informed about some other philosophies or things. And when you observe life, so this is the Gandhi quote, <laughs> When you observe life in general, and you think about strength and where it comes from, the most resilient people I've seen have been the people who are not just physically strong, but mentally, emotionally strong and what they've gone to to get to. So if you're a guide, if you're a coach, if you're or just a human, 
physical strength is a mere measurement of manipulating a load to some people. But what it really means to me is what you can mental your way through and that the barriers of fear, overcoming obstacles, you know, all of that is a true measurement of strength. So even a physical sense of looking at a person and judging them because they're tiny or they don't seem to appear in a certain way, you have no idea what that person's ultimate power and strength is. And so to really open the mind and get to know the person and then to also support people understand like this is a process. So, you know, let's sink our teeth in and that leads to the twight quote of the mind is primary. To me, the mind is our greatest tool and worst enemy simultaneously. When you're coaching someone, supporting someone, myself in general, trying to figure out where the barriers are. And usually it's our head. We have to train, apply tools, tactics to climb well and all these things. But ultimately, we can self-sabotage ourselves. For me, fear is irrational. A lot of people say, no, it's not. I say, well, in a way. So if a bear is chasing me, okay, fear there. I'm going to run. That's that's real. But if you're standing at the base of a climb you've prepared for and you've trained for and you've gained the knowledge and experience and you're afraid of it, that's okay. But it's also not yet you're fearing something that hasn't manifested. Maybe it's a fear of failure. Maybe it's a fear of risk. But that's where we want to try to utilize the mind as a tool and to set ourselves up for success. And so it's not as simple as I just made it sound, but that's where that philosophy for me comes from. And not to say there aren't other numerous other aspects. Well, I lead from my heart, but I use my mind primarily to make decisions and execute and to support people. Carolyn, I just wanted to say that I am just, I think it's so cool that you knew or you know Mark Twight because I consider myself a Twight hard. Um, and I just, I made that word up. I don't know if anyone else uh, besides me and my <laughs> friends use that phrase. But um, yeah, I love the mindset that uh, he kind of portrays. Oh, yeah, that's great. He, he, the, many, he has many disciples and followers. And he's a, he's, he's a dear friend and he used to get a bad rap a lot long time ago, sometimes when he was Dr. Doom and whatnot, but uh, he is a very kind soul. Don't, don't be fooled. (laughs) I find that with quotes, if I'm searching for something, it might sort of appear and coalesce and and be able to sort of distill maybe like in a, in a pithy way, something that I'm, I'd like to express, or that's sort of like clarifying something for me. And, And maybe that's not the case for those two quotes that you just had, but it seems like it was it offered some sort of direction, let's say. I'm wondering if these days there are any quotes that are coming to mind for you that might be guiding or top of mind. That's a really interesting observation, personal observation you, Aaron, and I would agree. I think times in our life when we read a quote that seems particularly poignant, you know, it grabs us. One of my favorites, of course, is Maya Angelou these days. And with that, there was one I saw just very recently where she said, I've learned that people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And, you know, that speaks incredibly deeply to the work I do and the way I've chosen to run my business, support my staff. That's fundamentally that speaks deeply to my philosophy. Would really like to talk about Ripple Effect Training Center, but I I feel like that would be a natural jump to just like talk about uh, what you're doing now. But I'd like to actually get a little bit of context and and history because I think that'll frame how you're how you're running your your business now and sort of the philosophy behind it. But you came up climbing and guiding in the '90s, and I'm curious what was the scene like then for for women in the you know that sport in the guiding world. Um, <laughs> there, there, there really wasn't, it wasn't one. There were a bunch of men <laughs> climbing. <laughs> no, uh, there, there weren't a lot of women. I was 
fortunate to have a lot of dear friends who climbed, who I could go climb with, whether it was a friend or boyfriend's various other things. But most of the time I climbed with men. So I, there just weren't women available to climb with. That time I was university in New Mexico and I grew up climbing in the Sandias. Then evolving into guiding, I first worked with the American Alpine Institute out of Bellingham years ago. And there were upwards of 30, 35 guides and two of us were women. So that was sort of the you know, that was the percentage. So, and even then, my client base, the clients that would sign up for trips, you know, alpine mountaineering and going to Bolivia and ice climbing and whatnot, 95% were men. So, there really wasn't a deep community, though a few of us definitely started gluing together to look to mentors and people, women that were doing things. Kitty Calhoun, that was kind of her heyday. Catherine Destevel, you know, they were five or six years older than me. And there were those people in the spotlights, you know, Lynn Hill. So we had women, but we were fairly separated. So fortunately for me, I was very much a tomboy growing up. And I also shunned sort of anything feminine at the time. I've evolved. But so I was out there to do my sport that I was passionate about climbing and guiding on an equal level. So I did not participate and do a fabulous job as a woman. I just did a really good job. And I wanted to take that gender role out of it and just be seen as an equal participant in this plane and try to set that role you know, establish that as an example for some men. Most of the men were very supportive, but there were definitely some men that were not and did not expect that I was as competent as they were. So that that was sort of the stage for me in the 90s was I had I definitely had a hard edge and I was definitely out to represent my gender well. You never wanted to adopt the Dr. Doom moniker as well? <laughs> well, sure. that, that, well, <laughs> it was already taken, but I wonder if you could do another. Right. Well, I mean, that's why Mark and I were friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> In an interview I had recently, the guest always sort of felt like uh, maybe other. They take this role where they can help cultivate more representation, but they sometimes just feel like they just want to want for it to be normalized. You know, they just want to be there climbing and enjoying themselves, and they don't want to always have to be recognized by their outward appearance. I don't know if I call it attention. They put it as feeling responsibility. And it sounded like maybe you did a little bit as well, which is, you know, I, I want to just be a climber, but you can get away from the fact that you're also a woman. And so you're sort of, you had this dynamic of like downplaying it as much as you could, but also like doing the best you can as a representation of. There's that dynamic of like, I just want to be accepted to do the sport I, I enjoy, but I also have these other dynamics at play that are sort of like part of me being here. I, I think it's a journey internal, external. We recognize over, hopefully over time that the stereotypes we're under and the judgment that is passed uh, toward us is not ubiquitous. That there are many people that are just, Dope to see you out climbing and, and people who have a different viewpoint on the world. However, we are sensitized and should be because things need to evolve and change toward the deeply embedded societal stereotypes, like things that I had to fight against as a female. If I did something well, gained notoriety, half the time there's an assumption that like maybe I slept with somebody, maybe somebody helped me out because I was pretty. Or if I went to do a climb with a man, it was obviously assumed that I didn't lead any of the pitches or I didn't lead crux pitches. So there's a percentage of the world that has this just embedded patriarchal mindset that is going to assume that. And so that's where my hackles would go up and what I was again trying to represent that that is not the case. So I had to just show up. The stress that it creates is that as a female climber and a climber that 
is known and is out in the public is you're under the watchful performing eye all the time. So you can't have a bad day. Mm -hmm. You can't go out and just be like, I really, I'm just feel like top roping because I want to. So there's, there's judgment attached, but that's not ubiquitous. Not everyone is going to view us that way. So remembering that and knowing these people in our lives that are wonderful friends and super supportive, this becomes the internal journey, right? There's the external we put out there, but it's how in our mindset we develop, we want to evolve in the change, but the change inside is that I don't care. I can't care about that. I am going to change in the future and move women's sport forward by being a positive representative. From that, you know, I am incredibly picky and always have been about who I rope up with. Mm. Just side note, just because I haven't climbed with someone doesn't mean I don't like them. But it's just, what's their dynamic? What kind of energy are we going to have together? How are we going to support each other? I'm also, I've said this for decades. And, you know, here's where the swearing comes in. I don't care how good a climber somebody is. An asshole is an asshole and yeah. I don't like assholes. So if you're going to have that negative attitude, I don't have time for that in my life at all. So that's just not the way it's going to roll. So it's navigating that, finding a way to support yourself, those around you, have boundaries, make choices, represent well, and understand that very likely that's the best way to progress women in our sport. And also just now, let's just talk about inclusivity all around beyond women. Uh, We could take that conversation into LBGTQ, all that's like, how do we support those people? Speak up for them, stand up for them, stand up for yourselves. Yeah. I can feel that person's stress at times. And I can also say that it does start to get a lot easier as you get older. I was wondering Do you think that that dynamic is more prevalent in the ice and mix community more than rock climbing or um, because I know you rock, ice climb, high altitude climb, ski mountaineering. Do you think there's a bit of a difference since ice climbing is I would consider ice climbing still a bit niche, even though it's probably not how it was 20, 30 years ago? Yeah, I think now in the current climate. That has changed a bit in bouldering and sport climbing, rock practices, and maybe trad too, depending on where you draw the line for traditional climbing. Just because more more women are participating in those uh, those aspects of the sport, uh, there are definitely more women in all aspects. But when you ca- get to more of the alpine ice mountaineering, high altitude mountaineering, we're still a minority. So I I think there's, there's still a lot more (laughs) work to be done. But yes, Mm -hmm. I would say it's probably still much more prevalent today. Being in a position where you can be a coach and, and a leader and a mentor in the past through guiding and then through your training, uh, programs and, and, and coaching. And now as it, as it's coalesced into ripple effect training center, I'm wondering how your experiences and personal development affect how you think about the business and the philosophy that that guides what you're what you're doing today. So Ripple Effect is very unique as a business. So we'll talk about it as a business. This simple format for people who don't know what I do. Ripple Effect Training is a strength conditioning training center in Carbondale, Colorado, specifically for mountain athletes. I use that term. And no, it's not for the elite and the elite train with us, but it's for everyone. But we're looking at individuals who the gym is designed to support their mountain activities, their outdoor activities. We don't train football players, basketball players, or someone who wants to get into body sculpting. So it's very specified to my history of outdoor athletics. Within that, though, within underneath all of that, my philosophy with business. So kind of hard to believe for many people, but in 10 years of running classes, for example, I have not increased class prices. I've slowly increased private prices. We live in a very expensive valley. 
I am in the Roaring Fork Valley down from Aspen, one of the most expensive places to live in the U.S. right now. And I have not, I have intentionally not created any sort of exclusivity by pricing. The philosophy is everyone's welcome. My philosophy is I want everyone to feel comfortable. I have athletes, numerous athletes. We're home to 200 athletes a month easily, kind of a revolving door of things. People feel safe. People feel supported. People feel that they can be where they are to progress forward without judgment. My staff, they're all independent contractors, but they set their own hours. They just tell me how much I owe them. I don't micromanage. I am not going to expand and do all these other things. People are always ask me about that. And I say, I do not believe in American 10x capitalism. Mm. When I look at our society and culture right now, there is nothing that has evolved in the last 50 years that I think is working. But capitalism has been our driving force. More and more money, dilute, just make it happen. Keep increasing prices. That's going to work, right? So for me, I make a comfortable living. My biggest expense is paying my staff. I pay my staff well. They get free continuing education from me. I bring in professionals. I have a three-level certification course that they get. They have all the time in the world for me. Because of that, I have basically zero staff turnover. I have the most phenomenal team of people who work with me. And it, it's reflected within our community. Within the community of athletes, we don't really have to advertise. Everything is word of mouth. Go to the ripple effect. Go to the ripple effect. Go to the ripple effect. So my journey of trying to set a standard, trying to help people feel safe, not judged, not stereotyped, help people heal through injury, return to the mountains, excel in the mountains, all goes to that Maya Angelou quote, how did you make people feel? What was the, that end result? And Again, I run a successful business. We did well through the pandemic. We came out the other side. We're thriving. But I have a very, very, very different philosophy as far as how I run my gym, how I pay people, how I look at money, how we approach things. And people ask me often, because that leads into the name of the business. As you can see now, you know, me wanting to be the drop of water that created positive change in others was where that started. And if I can give that to my staff and they can give that to our athletes, and then it just continues to roll over into people's lives and manifest. So it's different, but it is completely how I want it to be and roll. And it's set up too to hopefully continue if there's a time when I'm no longer wanting to be, you know, working. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I'm curious because everyone is a contractor. And so you talked about how you have a, a plan for if you want to move on. And I'm wondering how you're thinking about that. The reason why I'm asking what strikes me about how you're designing this business is it, it is so personal. It's so, this is how I want it to be structured. For context, my background was in startups and actually I, I got really fed up with it because it was just growth for growth's sake. But if it's personal and it's small enough and it's localized, like you can make the, the the numbers work for you. And you've built a successful business that you get to design how you want. So I guess I'm curious to sort of how you're thinking about like next steps. Well, yeah. So what happens, or at least in our, my tiny experiment, <laughs> is that because I have such a fabulous team, I've given so much of myself to them they are very dedicated. I've also spent a lot of time trying to teach them, of course, the, the training methodology, which they all know, allow them to have their own voice and script in it. It's like, you know, I don't know all, let's, let's collaborate. And the business is rolling along. I also coach people remotely online. So the brick and mortar supports itself financially at this point. I don't draw income from it. I have a online coaching business. Oh, that I also wow. oh, okay. Yeah, that was the pandemic. So that's all under ripple effect. 
So at any given time, I could extract and still have an income and they could keep running the business. And as far as I'm concerned, if one of them really stepped up and said, I'd like to, like if I was ready to say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about stepping away from the brick and mortar. And one of them was like, I'd, I'd really like to, to take that over from you. I'm not in this for money. A lot of these people don't have like however much money. So my thoughts and philosophy is like, well, run the business well and have the business, have the business pay me monthly for X number of years while you take it over and I will be done. And then I will be over here or over there or whatever. But I have set it up. So I always joke with them right now. You know, if I died tomorrow, you guys would be okay. <laughs> and then they're like, no, no, don't do that. I'm like, I'm not planning on it. Yeah. But they all, they know all the aspects. They know how to program. They know how to run the business. They know how to do billing. I mean, they've got it. And one of the things I love, the evolution. So I start. I moved Ripple Effect here 10 years ago. But one of the things I love is... When I first started here, it was just me. I had to build my reputation and build my staff. And everybody wanted to go train with Carol at Ripple Effect. And then it came to, oh, you just got to go to Ripple Effect. And then I started building a staff. And there are athletes that actually don't really know who I am. Oh, that's interesting. And there are athletes who are like, who ask for Betsy or Caitlin or Davis. or And I, it just makes me giddy. I was like, Yay! Because it's it's an entity. It's not just me anymore. It really is its own force, and that was my hope. Because that's a hard thing to do to build a business that when it, you start it, that no longer needs you. Uh, so we're, I mean, we're we're there. People love seeing me, but uh, I could definitely walk away. That's probably more businessy than you expected. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. <laughs> it does parlay into this. I'm wondering how you, how maybe you were when you were younger, but there seems to be like a, a lack of egocentricity. And the reason why I bring this up is because you mentioned Mark Twight earlier, but you've known Mark Twight and Steve House for decades at this point. And I kind of imagine you could have gained similar notoriety if you had wanted to, just based off the timing and space and, and the, the work that you were doing. And... Um, In our initial call, you purposely, you mentioned that you purposely tried to stay under the radar. And I guess I'm just curious, you know, how come? Mm -hmm. So visualize a Venn diagram here. (laughs) So there's a lot of different reasons that culminated into that short story, hopefully. When I was in college, I was racing bikes, road bikes, and then mountain bikes. And due to my own immaturity, I would say, First, I, you know, I had these experiences where I was really good. And then all of a sudden, my mental attitude toward my sport changed. And, you know, I, every ride had to be good and every training session had to be this and that. And so I realized in that moment, which was a great moment of learning that, that potentially that high level of competition and performance, not so much wasn't my thing, but it was like, I needed to recognize that how it affected my passion. So I did and do the sports I've done because of how they feed my soul. And so I took a step back and simultaneously, here's the societal piece. If I performed well, I was scrutinized. Hmm. 50% of the people support you, 50% of the people, and sadly, mostly women, if you're female, get cat-like. And so... You know, they'd be like, oh, Carolyn this and oh, Carolyn that. And you'd bristle a little bit. That was early, early on in reaction. And I, of course, put that somewhere else and walk away from it. I don't understand women who don't support women. But I understand our society, unfortunately, sets a lot of them up for seeing one another as competition versus someone you'd want to support, especially if they're doing well and they're representing the sport well. There's a lot that we could unpack there. But then as I continued to grow in sports, so from there, you know, I skied, I did ultra endurance stuff. I got into climbing. So as I got more into climbing, I set cycling aside and same kind of thing. I had some talent. I did well. But I did still notice that when I would rise to the top, there would be criticism from some, support from some, criticism from some. 
And I could feel how that emotionally affected me. Sometimes the mental gerbil wheel we can get into when we're young with, well, they said this and they did this and how frustrated you got. Felt like such a enormous quantum massive waste of psychic energy and time that I evolved towards like, you know what? That's internal, external. I don't want to deal with that, but I need to figure out how to balance that with myself. And through being pretty competent early on in a lot of sports, I had an opportunity to find partners and help others. So this is another little bubble that evolved this. I noticed that when I stepped into the arena of teaching and helping, and I saw someone succeed who had a greater barrier to success potentially than maybe I did, because I was lucky to have a certain talent or strength or whatever, I felt so excited for them. Mm. I would get goosebumps. I would be giddy. I started to recognize that I actually derived more satisfaction or as much out of seeing someone else succeed as feeling that success myself. And so the last little bubble, I think, I think I'm hitting them all (laughs) as quickly as I can. I remember a dear friend skiing with me one day. We're up in the San Juans in um, Colorado. And she was like, why aren't you a more heavily sponsored climber. She's like, you could do all those things. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm just not selfish enough. And I mean that in the most honest of ways. It's like to be the most elite, you have to focus on you. And I said, when I'm given the opportunity to help someone else, I'm going to go over there. And there's no judgment one way or another, purely what fills my heart. And that's what I would rather do. So it all sort of came together And right under the saying under that radar meant that there was less noise I had to filter. I still was sponsored so I could do things, but I was more at a guide level so that I had more access to directly change and evolve people's lives. And, you know, I I was harnessing all of my talents as an athlete, but my heart as far as what filled my soul to sort of help people, humanity. So that's where I chose to kind of cruise along and have my, have my world in effect. I just wanted to say that I resonate so much with what you're saying about being a a woman in this kind of sport and how you always feel like you have to represent an entire world of women when you're out there. And I guess What kind of advice would you give to women like me that are still, you know, I'm still like, I'm in the best shape of my life, but I want to, I want to, I feel like I have even more potential and I want to keep taking it to the next level, but I still deal with that, that background noise that you're talking about. And it comes from all types of people. It comes from even mentors. I almost get some animosity sometimes with just uh, climbing partners. I'm just so inspired by your I don't know, just kind of letting it roll off your back. I, I, I still feel like I struggle with that. I, I think I'm, you touched on being an empath. I feel like I'm just so empathetic and then it kind of, I internalize it. And I don't know, what's, what, what would your advice be for, for kind of working through those? That's a tough situation to, to, to work through. And I think some of the societal conditioning that women have, received is still grow up with is probably one of the barriers. Remember, I would tell people, remember, it's okay to have unapologetically high standards. Remember, it's, it's okay to have your own voice and standards. And then, as I've said, you know, you can be particular about who you climb with. Understand years ago, I recognized with so much of that, if you're climbing with people who are younger, it's also there in this process too, that so much of their own internal insecurity that they are projecting onto you, that to find that space and bandwidth within you to work on, is this me or is this them? And how am I allowing that to affect me internally. And that's hard. Everyone has to do their, their work. And 
being open to having conversations about how certain things make you feel, being okay about being selective about partners, continuing to work on those relationships that seem really supportive and have that faith in yourself. And it's hard, but don't let anybody steal your thunder. And that's kind of what people do when they when they slide in and <clears throat> kind of <clears throat> undermine or say say things. And I wish more people in this world would stop and taste their words before they speak. But I, I don't really think that that is in constant practice. So I don't know that I gave you a singular tools necessarily to work with that, but more maybe just a philosophic mindset of it is okay to be where you are and just continue to do that work understand how much of it is you and do your internal work because that's the only person that you could truly change. And then things do roll off your back a little bit more effectively. And ultimately, not everybody likes me. That's okay. (laughs) (laughs) Now we're going to transition a little bit more to talking about training as a female athlete. And just for some context and expectation setting for you, the listener, we're going to be focusing on younger and also peri and postmenopausal women. So we're going to focus on from there three sort of pillars. One is finding your power and cultivating support, which is sort of the this more psychosocial component of this trading concept and methodology. And we've talked a little bit about that. Two is hormone cycles and how that affects the the female body. And three, the importance of fueling. And all these are sort of integrated. As, as it relates to training and thinking about training and thinking about self-care and things like that. Just to start, you know, why should women consider strength training and especially for sports like ice climbing or dry tooling? So we'll look at this, I think there are a few angles, but generally there are more exceptions now. Women don't have a ton of experience with strength training growing up and they're not exposed to it in our culture. Of course, that's changing. And that is generally. And many women growing up do not participate in sports that develop upper body strength. So for women and leaning towards the the sport of climbing, ice climbing, strength training can be an incredibly effective tool to feel more comfortable and confident in the sport. So strength training fundamentally creates movement economy. The stronger you are relative to your body weight, every single thing will be easier. So these are some big statements and oversimplifications, but movement economy, whether it's running up a mountain, whether it's ice climbing, pulling yourself up over something, it can't replace technical ability, of course. We have to practice our craft, but being strong really, really helps that. I was having a conversation with a young female climber the other day, that husband, male partner, and I had coached her. Um, I say young, she just turned 40, but younger than me. And her goal as a mother of two was to climb 512. And she hadn't climbed 512 before, and she did. And so she reflected back to me that the thing that she felt was the biggest contributor was her strength training program that I gave her. And I reflected back to her. I said, you know, what men, no harm, no foul, do not understand is for most women, there's a huge strength gap because women don't have the same levels of testosterone that men do. Most men come out with a lot more strength than a woman just baseline. On top of the fact they tend to have bigger bone structure, which just means they have more muscle mass and they're designed a little differently. I mean, men have 10 to 20 times the amount of testosterone that women do. And that's all fine. That's physiologic. But as as an example of my history in strength training and this woman at 40, women can gain strength and women can get strong by using the right practices with strength training, which is what I do at my gym. We can get strong and not get bulky, which is very beneficial for a strength weight ratio sport. And then addendum, 
to talk a little bit more about strength training from a health perspective. Short term, it's going to protect joints. It's going to keep you strong and stable through your menstrual cycle where hormones can fluctuate and you can deal with some ligament tendon laxity. It's going to help with bone density long-term. Now we're kind of heading into perimenopause, menopause, and aging, protect you from slip and fall. So having a lifetime of strength training is beneficial on every level from sport performance, you know, to health, to wellness as we get older. You talked about some physiological and biological differences between the male and and female body, but are there other major considerations that, that women should consider and understand? You know, for example, the 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 angle of I think the hip to the the knee makes it so that women's bodies tends to have a higher incidence rate of I think uh, knee injuries, for example. It certainly can, and this is where that strength training component with good form can come in. Some women, not all, you know, have wider hips and knees tend to knock in, but that can also be a result of some hypermobility. So we we see that more and more young athletes, men and women, but but women have a bit of joint laxity. It sounds like a big fancy term, but it just means that ligaments are a little bit looser and they can lock out joints and they rely on levering off a joint versus using a muscle to articulate the limb at the joint. And so when you're loading that ligament, like ligature, you're much more likely to injure it versus stabilizing it with a muscle. Therefore, we can reduce that risk of knee injury, for example, by teaching that person how to articulate that limb under load with proper alignment and bring a little bit more awareness to their movement patterns so that when they're out running, skiing, climbing, whatever it might be, riding horses, they're in their body a little bit more effectively and they have that strength to protect that joint because that's our number one thing for joint protection well let me throw another thing in there mobility and strength you know that's longevity as far as joints and injury prevention for someone that's new to strength training because every person every body is different when you first meet a client you know where do you start and where do you sort of try to position their headspace to start to understand this, th- these concepts? When someone comes in for the first time, our goal is to find out what their training background is. Many, many women and men who are sort of mountain athletes have never really been in a gym. They should be, but they want to be outside. <laughs> so find out if they know anything about strength training, if they're comfortable in the gym space, if uh, they have any injuries and limitations and what their goals are. Every single individual is an athlete. If you care about your health and wellness, you're an athlete. You're welcome in our gym and we meet you where you are. Then they can ask me questions that they'd like or my staff, whoever's doing the initial consult. And then based on all that, I will sort of evolve their session. I might head out onto the gym floor, give them a tour. I might take them through some movement assessments. I might talk to them about if they're, if they're a mom and they've had children and never had physical therapy or postpartum pelvic floor or transverse abdominus work done, we might go into that. But the goal is to meet the person where they are and to help them feel comfortable, to explain to them that slow is fast learning really good form is the most effective thing and that everything will evolve organically as they need. And we're here to support them. When you're working with a female client, do you, do you ever dive into hormones and tracking cycles and, and how, you know, cause you said you, you had a client who just had two kids. She sent five twelve. I think that's incredibly impressive. I'm just curious if, her hormones had, uh, if you had to assist her with that, or if that wasn't really a factor, I only asked because I dealt with pretty much all last summer and fall, my own trials and tribulations of stopping birth control after 15 years and um, kind of transitioning back to my own natural hormones. And, and it greatly affected me. I'm just curious with your client and then also you just sending your own project yesterday and is this any consideration or, uh, or you didn't pay attention? 
For the athletes that I coach and I coach directly, yes, hormones and where they are in their cycle is a huge component of what we do. I use a training piece platform. And so I am always checking. I put in there when they're on day one, day 10, day 17, day 28 to 30, depending on when people menstruate. Because hormones for women who do still menstruate or are not period menopausal, they have a massive effect on our physiology. And that it has not become mainstream conversation, sadly, yet. Dr. Stacey Sims, who wrote Roar and Next Level, coined the phrase, we're not tiny men. And it's very true. And unfortunately, most of Western medicine is designed off studies of male physiology. So we now know now that the beginning of our cycle, first 10 days, estrogen is dominant. That is a time that we can perform really highly. Uh, less carbohydrate need, clearer head, more energy, you know, estrogen helps in oxygen uptake in the blood, all of these lovely things. And I'm not going to go into the science of what that's doing in the uterine lining and all that. We come to ovulation, another great time for performance and strength because testosterone is high. We talked before, testosterone, men have a lot more. Testosterone is the strength hormone. So you might feel stronger. It's also a sexual driver. So of course, that's when it's going to peak when you're ovulating. That's our physiology for survival of species. Later, after somewhere around day 17, progesterone becomes the big dominant hormone. It's a tricky one. We need carbohydrates to produce it. We need progesterone. I have met women over the years who are actually like allergic to their own progesterone, who have just, it, it, there's, there's this endless stream of how much information I've been given about how women are challenged by this, but knowing when progesterone spikes, you're going to crave foods like a bucket of ice cream. You're going to be more tired and have a harder time motivating. You might underperform. None of that ultimately, I should say, should matter in the sense of you know life. This is life. You have a cycle. But knowing that so that you can dial in when you're doing trips, when you're going to try to send your project, when you're going to do a thing is important. Understanding that you might underperform in a certain part of your cycle is great for cutting yourself some slack. It's like, oh, I just felt off today. I was tired. My head felt weird. It's like, well, you're on day 24 of your cycle. You know, you're not really, your progesterone might be coming to play, plus all a myriad of other things. But it's incredibly informative. So I use that to help support women and guide women in more than anything, like give them emotional support. Sometimes it's more clinical than that. And I won't go down that clinical road. People with endometriosis, people who have other stuff, we have to dig a little deeper there. But like you just mentioned, coming off the pill. So that's a big one. Uh, They're just barely, I've got some articles I'm going to share with Aaron. You can put in the notes of the podcast of trying to begin studies of how these birth control hormones affect women's performance. Some women choose to use hormone-based IUDs. So in that case, they don't menstruate. So it's harder for them to know when they're cycling. So that can be difficult. It also creates a situation where they don't know if they're dealing with REDS, which I think is a fairly common term now, but um, it's the relative energy deficiency syndrome that happens with women who under fuel and no longer menstruate, what that does to their cardiovascular health and their bone density. So with those hormones, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to be unpacked. And so, yeah, it definitely affects people's performance and training. And yes, I definitely dive in to that with the women I coach that are your age. And personally, congratulations on getting off the birth control pill. Uh, That's not simple. But again, hopefully it's been a good thing. And you're feeling more like yourself. It takes some time. Postpartum women, it can take up to two years after having a child before their hormones are back to somewhat normal based on that situation. So I always encourage them to know, like, it's going to take a while to get to where you feel like yourself. Then we go into perimenopause and postmenopause. And Sarah, you had asked me about, do I track my hormones? Well, the good thing is I'm fully postmenopausal. 
so I have not menstruated for five years. And so I'm kind of like, Boop. <laughs> and so I don't get those great spikes, but I don't get those lows. And I kind of am in this place where I have less energy and I need more sleep to perform. And I have to really watch my protein intakes and my which everyone should do. We can get into that. But I help a lot of perimenopausal and postmenopausal women with a lot of support so that they can continue to perform. It's not a, it's not a simple journey for most. Along those lines, did you know what to expect when you were approaching menopause? And maybe could you share for, for others that might be approaching it or, or going through it now? Like what, what might one expect? And do you have any recommendations for how to plan and prepare? So it's, yeah. Did I know what to expect? Mm, Sort of. Again, this is something that I believe we need to have more conversations about. So societally, women have mostly been historically shunned from talking about it and sort of been just suck it up and deal. It's just something you have to go through, which is, of course, because most studies are done on the male model. The joke, of course, is this happened to men. We'd know everything about it and have all kinds of different support for it. So my, so I'm very vocal, as you can imagine, in supporting women. And I find all the articles, and I read all the books, and I do all the things. And I want to see women support women. So 20% of women are going to go through menopause statistically with very little side effects, very, very little happening, which is amazing. The other 80% can be rock and roll. So they're going to have brain fog, significant weight gain potentially that you cannot control with just less food in and more exercise, which is very frustrating because that's what people tell you to do. Profound fatigue, night sweats, depression, anxiety, stable or unstable blood sugar levels, prediabetes, it goes on and on, vaginal dryness, painful sex. I mean, you start listing all of this stuff and it's it's pretty brutal. I cruised along for the first couple of years going into perimenopause and never and didn't think much about it. I was like, oh, you know, I'm getting some hot flashes, things like that. I was someone who was very fortunate through life to have a very normal menstrual cycle. And I had chosen as a very young woman to not utilize any hormonal supplement because I did not think Western medicine knew what they were doing. And I didn't believe based on what I had read about how the pill was developed that they understood potential long-term and this was just me. So I had a pretty, you know, I was lucky that that was how my body was. And then all of a sudden, 51 also, it came around the time of the pandemic and my business being closed and various other things. My symptoms got catastrophically bad. And I talked to people about that because this is where we have to have the language of what women have to survive. Like, I have climbed, I don't know how many high altitude peaks. I have suffered through this, that, and the other. There's no doubt that I don't have a suffer gene and that I'm not strong and capable. And I was getting crushed two to three hours a night of sleep for eight to nine months, hot flashes, all this kind of stuff where I finally was like to a naturopath. I talked to a bunch of people. I got the books. I read the things. My brother is a geneticist. I asked him for articles. I had a client who was an OBGYN surgeon who was retired. So I, again, was lucky to have resources. So I went after those resources and learned as much as I could and did not know most of that before it hit me like a ton of bricks, which is where, again, I want to be that person that is available for women to talk to, to get advice where I can recommend where they can go. Cause I am not a physician, but I've had women who are in their perimenopause, menopause, who have gone to their primary care physician and gotten no help who have been told because they're, they're so indoctrinated in Western medicine that they could, Oh, well, we'll just give you an antidepressant. That's a very common knee jerk for their anxiety and, and other issues. And so I will tell that woman to try to find a different primary care practitioner because that is not 
the case. And I've got all of this stuff consolidated to just copy paste to an email of ways they can start learning and listening and trying to find the resources because they don't have the time and the bandwidth. So I'm, I kind of feel I can be that person to help get that information to them more readily so they can find the support. That's what I want to do. And every and to reinforce, just like with young women, the older women, every woman goes through perimenopause and menopause differently because every one of us has a different background and history. I never had children. I didn't go on a hormonal birth control. Those were my choices. Other people have had kids. They've been on IUDs. They've had stuff. It's genetic. How was mom's menopause? Some women have had cancer and they've been on hormone blocking treatments for decades and they have to come off those things. So it, there's a myriad of stuff, but there's more and more information out there and more and more doctors and scientists, clinicians are gaining momentum and getting their voice and information out there. So we're on the cusp of some really cool things. Uh, and I, yeah, I do work with a lot of women on that and really want to be able to support women through that process. I was wondering, Carolyn, when you were going through menopause, did you have any climbing partners that, you know, cause you, you can't really, someone else can't really see those symptoms. Did you have any people that were doubting you? Because I mean, I imagine if you're only getting two to three hours of sleep for eight to nine months that you, you can't perform the way you want to perform. Did you have any friends or climbing partners close to you that thought that it was more in your head and more of like a an anxiety thing? Like you were, your lead head was down or um, was everyone just kind of like, no, Carolyn's a boss. Like, yeah, this is, this is real. And like, we're just going to have some space for that. Fortunately, and this goes back to like my, my choices and things. Um, no, I didn't deal with the negativity because if anyone was going to be negative, I was ignoring them. And to the the people that I chose to be around, you're very kind. I'm using those words, I think Carolyn's the boss. But I there's there's a lot. I'm very honest and very direct about those things, and I'm also private in the sense that I'm like hey, I'm just gonna tough it out. But I was fortunate to not have to filter a lot of that. And I think that is reflective of the people that I choose to have close to me uh, and our mutual respect for one another. But to also to a very important point that leans towards this concept I've talked about about being kind to yourself and cutting yourself some slack. I almost completely stopped climbing during that period of time because of what the sport of climbing requires of one beyond the physical realm. But the mental edge, I had a significant amount of stress for trying to save my business through the pandemic and support my staff financially. And then I wasn't sleeping really well. So that was a time where you know I, I needed something to, to fulfill that requirement of what climbing does for me as far as filling my soul and getting me away from tech and really emphasizing the things that truly matter in life. And that actually is when I took up fly fishing. So although I've always been a climber and always will, I recognize I'm like, okay, right now I probably should just, you know, honor the fact that I am in a very deep energy hole and I need to rebuild before I try and climb hard again. And so I took up fly fishing, which was the perfect thing. And my husband, again, I'm fortunate. My husband used to be a fly fishing guide when I was a climbing guide. So yeah, he had all sorts of stuff and I got into it and we, yeah, I love it. Uh, hooked in the, that's a bad pun. Um, but it was the perfect thing because it wasn't physically demanding, but it was away from tech, away from phones, away from people, the quiet, nurturing spirit of nature, water, and something that was highly mentally and physically engaging because it's not simple. Right on. I probably should have picked up a spare hobby. I just gritted my teeth and bared it and just thrashed. <laughs> That's all right. You're, you're, uh, it's just that you're you're younger. You got now. You've got an idea for for, for next time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and let me reinforce: at your age, I would have done exactly the same thing. 
hundred <laughs> percent. Speaking of sort of recuperation or finding ways to fuel yourself, but in a, in a different avenue, uh, specifically, I'm talking about nutrition. What are some considerations that women should focus on as it relates to macros and, and things like that in order for performance and training? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'll touch on some big points kind of lately, but what I really want to uh, reinforce is if someone has some really significant questions, if they've dealt with reds or amenorrhea losing their period, if they are underperforming historically, ultimately working with a really good sports dietitian for a period of time can be a, a huge gift. So I want to encourage people to do that. But beyond that, the things that I have observed, let's go to something simple, protein requirements. For some reason, and this is, again, these are big universal statements. I know there are exceptions to this. But for women who are in strength-based sports, which is climbing, but in all sports, women who train a fair amount, beyond just, say, someone who just does their healthy you know, 45 minutes a day of exercise, somebody who's really got a lot of output, Protein requirements, a lot of science that's out there. And that's something that women somewhat historically run short on. And I think some of that tends towards coming from this place, a little bit of the caloric restriction, body imagey thing that can happen in women's sports. So they go to vegetables a lot because you can eat a lot and not have a lot of calories. Again, trying not to make huge broad sweeping strokes, but with protein requirements, we're looking at 1.8 to 2.4 grams of protein a day per kilogram of body weight. So I weigh 135 pounds. I need 100 to 130 grams of protein a day. You start looking that into that dietarily, that's actually a fair amount. Not really calorically, but, but volume-wise. That's in Dr. Stacey Sims' book that I've heard that in Huberman podcast, like it, this is collectively out there. Someone could be on the low end of that if they were just kind of like, yeah, like I said, a healthy athlete. Someone like Sarah, myself, you, this applies to you as well, Aaron. With the kind of output that we want, we need those higher protein intake. Again, that is not statistically paleo. I want people to think this is a paleo thing. That's still of your caloric intake, probably only about 30%. Women tend to be hit under the mark. The other pieces of fueling is actually just fueling. I helped in a women's seminar for runners years back, and I was pretty amazed when the nutritionist who was there asked the women participating, I was a speaker, to write down the first word or say the first word that came to mind when she said the word calorie. And all of them said restrict versus fuel. So calories are fuel. To move our body, we need fuel. So to really understand that we need carbohydrates to think, we need carbohydrates to move our limbs when we are at much higher heart rates, we need proteins to rebuild our muscle, we need fat as fuel for long endurance, for protecting connective tissue, for all of these for recovery. So we need all of these components and, and we need quite a bit and how to fuel before activity, during activity, and how much restriction will ultimately end up with potentially causing risk to health, adrenal fatigue, cardiovascular you know, issues, uh, bone density issues, a lot of different things. Again, really supporting people to get to someone to help them if they have nutritional needs really, really target those proteins, try to get carbs, proteins, and fats in every meal, plan your day, plan your fueling, don't head out without more than enough food for the day. I think the heaviest thing in my climbing pack every day is my food bag. Um, I like snacks. So it's really, it's really important for, um, for women to, to really address that. You had originally mentioned the influence of nutrition on hormones as well? Well, I think the, the, the biggest considerations really are the things that I've talked about sort of in summary of the lack of fueling 
leading to a situation of you know, relative energy deficiency syndrome with reds and women. And so with that, the lack of fueling and a lack of calories, when your menses stop, uh, because you don't have enough calories in, women have to have enough body fat to produce estrogen, we need carbohydrates to produce progesterone. Um, if, if, if it gets to that extreme, that particular situation is a significant health risk. And really, unfortunately, still to this day, in many um, elite endurance and ultra endurance coach sports, there's still some pressure from male coaches for women to lose their periods um, and to drop weight and lose weight. That's not a good thing. And so uh, I'll make sure to attach the, you know, some articles on that for you so women can begin to understand. And it's really, really psychologically really challenging. And we'll probably touch on that really quickly. Then the other end of the spectrum of where women are in perimenopause, I was actually climbing with a friend yesterday when I get done my project who's deeply in perimenopause and I'm sort of, you know, post. And so one of the ways I can support her is she's having a very difficult time. And so helping her understand where she can adjust her nutrition to increase the protein intake because she really needs it for muscle recovery. She needs it for maintaining her muscle mass to really monitor her fat intake to help her body calm down. So she's getting sleep caloric restriction can spike anxiety in, in women who are older. We get more cortisol production because it causes a stress. Our cortisol levels are already high as we go into menopause and any sleep disruptions spike that. So proteins help with muscle mass. The fat and soothing calories aren't going to make you fat. You know, they're going to help support your system so that you sleep and you recover. And that you might have to cut back on carbohydrates a little bit to help with your insulin stabilization because with the drop in the hormones, we sometimes lose insulin sensitivity and blood sugar may feel very erratic. I went through that. I had days that I went out and I didn't do anything, but I felt like lightheaded and bonky and weird. And I just have to tell my husband if I was with him, I'm like, I, I don't know. Like I might be able to go on this run or I might have to turn around. Like I feel awful. So helping her, you know, navigate that. So that's where that shift is a little different post-menopause. The broad sweeping thing is to not, you know, we're not restricting calories. We're sh- trying to start shifting the source to support what happens when we no longer have that same pulse of hormones. And although it, we are in decline from around middle age of 35, it does sort of fall off a cliff for women differently than men when they do actually hit perimenopause. When the ovaries stop functioning and stop producing hormones, it's like, it's kind of a big whammy for most women. Impressive ability to talk in broad strokes, but also like dive deep on a topic and then like kind of bounce back for perspective. I imagine there might be a lot more questions about specifics. Unfortunately, we can't do that today, but um, maybe you'll join us again sometime. I do really appreciate you both chatting today and and joining the, the conversation. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, Sarah. But as we always do, we end with a question. And this question is, if you were to give your younger self one piece of beta, what would that be? (laughs) So I I think little hints and bits of this probably came out in our conversation. And I do know that that question is something that is directed to be inspiring to younger women out there. But I came up with this little packed quote of just saying um, to remember, ideally life is long, stick to the path as you see it now, but be willing to pivot when an opportunity arrives. Follow your heart, but use your head. Have unapologetically high standards and do not let anyone steal your thunder. You're on your way to becoming an even more amazing woman than you are right now. That's the advice I'd give. (laughs) I love it. Rock on. As 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 Sarah demonstrated. 
<laughs> for those who can't see. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely. If you'd like to learn more about Ripple Effect Athlete Training Center or coaching with Carolyn, you can visit the company website, rippleeffecttraining.com. To follow along with Carolyn's latest endeavors, her Instagram account is at blitzkriegbarbie. Carolyn was kind enough to share many resources that we touched upon in this episode. So to find links to books, research papers, articles, and more, head to the show notes. Wrapping up, if you enjoyed this episode and others we've done so far, please do leave us a review on whichever platform you listen on. Ratings and reviews let others, and begrudgingly, the algorithm, know that this is a worthwhile podcast to check out. As always, thank you to Hannah Noel for providing the intro music and Andrew Salomone for editing. Thanks for listening. See you all next week.